Thank you, everyone. Good morning. Good news. You're almost to the end. I'm the last presenter here this morning before we get to our final Q&A session. I think I know most of you, but just by way of a brief introduction, uh, I'm Neil Doherty. I'm the Chief Financial Officer here at Keysight. I've been with the company uh, for about 24 years, having hired into HP way back in 1996. I've been in this role as the CFO of Keysight since 2013. Ron named me to the position about a year prior to our spin. We spent that first year working on preparing Keysight for its independence. And since that time, we've been working with the team, executing the strategy we've talked about today and helping to improve the financial performance of our business. There are five themes that I wanna to touch on today. The first is that we have in fact dramatically transformed Keysight's financial performance over our first five years as an independent company. And that includes significant progress was made in our most recent fiscal year when we saw our gross margins climb to 63%, our operating margins elevate to 24%, and our free cash flows double to almost $900 million. We are a market leader in a large growing end market that we estimate is currently about $17.5 billion in size. And we've actually taken share in that market in each of our five years of, of, of Keysight. We've been able to take that share because of the sustained investments we have made and that we continue to make in R&D and sales to position us to outgrow the market. And increasingly, that growth is coming from our migration to selling our customers complete solutions. Solutions that are first to market, solutions that are differentiated, and solutions that have high software and services content. And it's that migration that is helping with the resiliency of our top line, as well as helping to drive our improved mar margin performance. So as a result, today we are once again in a position to raise the bar in the financial expectations for this business as we look forward. We now expect to drive our operating margins to the 26 or 27% level, and we expect to reach that goal by our fiscal 23. So with that, let's start by taking a look at the financial transformation we've undergone over the last few years. When we spun out, the single biggest challenge that the management team faced was how do you take a business that's been underinvested in and has been basically flat for over a decade and get it to the point where it could once again grow sustainably and consistently? As you can see, we've grown our revenue over the last five years at a compounded annual growth rate of 11%. Now that includes the, the, the revenue that we've added from the 10 acquisitions that we've completed, but more importantly, it includes the fact that we've once again got this business growing organically. We knew it would take a while for us to achieve that objective, and in fact it did. But over the course of the last two years, this business had averaged a core growth rate that excludes the impact of acquisitions and currency, and an average core growth rate of 12%. And as I've said, that growth rate, or that growth that we've enjoyed in our business has largely been driven by our migration towards selling differentiated solutions with high software content, which has helped to drive dramatic increases in our gross margin performance. Over our first five years, we've added almost 700 basis points to our gross margin, and we've done a good job of converting that gross margin to higher levels of profitability, increasing our operating margins over the same period of time by almost 600 basis points. I think it's important to note that not only have we increased our operating margins by 600 basis points, we've done so while at the same time increasing our investment in R&D by an additional 400 basis points, from 12% of revenue at the time of our spend to 16% of revenue, which is what we expect to he spend here in our fiscal FY20. Our fish cash flows ex have expanded dramatically, tripling since inception and doubling in our most recent fiscal year and we've delivered 17% compounded annual EPS growth over the last five years, including 46% EPS growth in FY19. You'll notice that our EPS growth really accelerated over the last two years, and that corresponds with the return of this business towards organic growth. I mentioned that our, our growth and financial performance are being driven by a mix shift that's underway in our business, and so I'd like to take a moment and talk about the current mix of our revenues. We've actually seen mix shifting across a number of different vectors. The first one I want to talk about has been a mix shift that's been underway for quite some time, I'd say well over a decade, that we've been working to migrate our revenues more to, so that we're selling more of our products into our customers' R&D labs than we are into their manufacturing lines. And as you can see, in FY19, almost 60% of our revenues were sold into, into those R&D labs, 
with about 30% into manufacturing and the remaining 12% into post-installation, operational, and optimization type applications. We like the R&D sale because it's higher gross margin, and it's also a more stable revenue stream as our customers look to maintain their investments in research and development across the macroeconomic cycle. I do think it's important that we don't over-rotate on this message. As you heard from Ron and as you heard from Satish, we are not looking to get out of the manufacturing business. In fact, we're looking to do the opposite. We want to continue to grow our revenues from high-value manufacturing. We're just focused on those manufacturing markets where there's a premium that's paid for a relatively sophisticated level of test. The second way our mix has been shifting is with migration towards higher software and services revenues. You can see in FY19, software and services made up a full 30% of our, our revenues, or $1.3 billion of total revenue in, in fiscal 19. Both of those businesses have over the last several years, and we expect will continue to grow at an above average rate for the company, and we expect them to be an ever larger portion of our total revenues. Our software and services businesses provide the basis of our recurring revenue, which is currently about 18% of our total, uh, total revenue. As I mentioned in the first Q&A, I see this as one of the biggest opportunities that exists for Keysight over the next few years. Not only do we expect software and services to expand at, a, at an above average rate, but we have a big opportunity within our software portfolio to change the way our customers buy software from Keysight. They still predominantly buy software from us on a perpetual or one-time basis, and we want to migrate that purchase and the way customers buy software from us to being a, a time-based or subscription-based sale. This mix shift has been, a, uh, has been an important contributor in enabling us to meet our financial commitments, and I now want to talk about the commitments we made at our last analyst day in this room two years ago. The top four commitments at this page, on this page all relate uh, back to the operating model that we outlined at our last on analyst day. And whether you're talking about revenue growth, prof, uh, margins, either gross or operating, cash flow, or EPS, we have exceeded the financial hurdles that we set forth at, at, at our last analyst meeting. We also talked about the objectives for two of our larger acquisitions. The acquisition of Anite, which was completed in August of 2015, and the acquisition of Ixia, which was completed in April of 2017. The Anite acquisition at this point is well ahead of where we expected it to be when we completed that transaction. We've certainly realized the cost synergies, but it's on the revenue synergy side that we're significantly ahead of our own expectations. And that's because the technologies that we acquired with the Anite acquisition have been absolutely critical to the success we've enjoyed and are enjoying in the 5G marketplace. With, with regard to Ixia, as we approach the three-year anniversary of that transaction, we are behind where we expected to be, but there is good news. The, the markets for Ixia products have been a little bit slow over the past couple of years as we've been caught in a bit of a lull between 100 gigabit and 400 gigabit. But over the last several quarters, we've started to see those investments in 400 gigabit pick up with it our own business and our own business results. And as you heard from Satish, we remain convinced that the strategic thesis for bringing these two businesses and these technologies together under to one roof absolutely remains intact particularly as 5G commercializes and the lines between wireless and wireline, physical air test and protocol air test continue to blur. Importantly, uh, even though we are behind, we are not lowering our return expectations for this business, although it may take us a little bit longer to reach our original return hurdles. The last thing I wanted to touch on was our growth initiatives. Over the years, we've talked about a number of growth initiatives, 5G, next-gen auto, software, services. In aggregate, those growth initiatives are well ahead of where we expected them to be. And in FY19, in, in aggregate, they grow at a, a rate of about 30%. Keysight, and those growth initiatives align well with what's driving our end markets today. That end market is about a $17.5 billion end market. It's growing at a rate of about 3 to 5% on average over the longer term. In our most recent fiscal year, we did $4.3 billion of revenue, making us the number one player in this market. But as Ron mentioned, we only have 25% share, which leaves us ample room to continue to outgrow the market. 
We believe there are a number of long-term secular growth themes that will drive growth in our end markets for the foreseeable future. And we believe that our own differentiation in the marketplace aligns well with those themes. So I'm talking about 5G, next-gen auto, IoT, and I think you can add aerospace defense up, uh, modernization to that list as well. And it's because of these growth themes and our differentiation that we today are raising the long-term growth expectations for Keysight to 4 to 6 percent. That 4 to 6 percent growth rate is important because we remain committed to the, to, to oper to the operating model that we've been talking about over the last five years. And that operating model calls for us to deliver 40 percent operating leverage any time our core growth rate is 4 percent or higher. You can do the math on that. But at our current revenue and profit levels, if we grow a top line 4%, deliver on 40% operating leverage, we can add about 60 basis points of operating margin improvement every year. And it's because of our confidence in our end markets and in our ability to execute to this operating model that today we are raising the long-term operating margin expectations for the business to 26 or 27%. For those of you that were here, you will remember that two years ago, we set a target to take our business from the op level we were at that point, which is in the high teens of operating margin, and drive it to 21 or 22% operating margin, although we expected it would take us to fiscal 21 to get there. Not only do we meet that uh, objective, we exceeded it, delivering 24% operating margin and doing it two years early in fiscal 19. So we'll now be working to drive our profitability to the 26 or 27% level, that's a full 500 basis point improvement over the prior model and an additional 300 basis point, basis point improvement over the record results that we delivered last fiscal year. Along, not only is our business highly profitable and is that profitability continuing to improve, but we believe we have a unique and durable business model that provides resiliency in a wide variety of macroeconomic circumstances. That macro resiliency comes from the structural flexibility that we've worked over the years to add to our cost structure. It comes from the roughly 50% of manufacturing that's been outsourced. It comes from the approximately 25% of sales that flow through an indirect channel. And from my perspective, the most important element is the fact is, is it comes from the fact that we have aligned the compensation of our employees with the results of our business and the interest of our shareholders. 100% of Keysight employees have a portion of their pay that fluctuates with Keysight's business performance. And for our broad employee population, the metrics that drive that variable payout are organic growth and operating margin. So should we get into a macro event that puts downward pressure on our growth rate and on our operating margins, I have an instantaneous, automatic, and structural way to make a meaningful reduction in the single largest component of my cost structure. And that gives us great confidence in our ability to be highly, highly profitable and a highly cash flow generative across the macroeconomic cycle. This business, in fact, delivered almost $900 million of free cash flow in FY19, which allowed us to enter fiscal 20 in a very strong balance sheet situation. If you take a look at our current balance sheet, our gross leverage is approximately one and a half times EBITDA. We have almost $1.7 billion of cash on the balance sheet, and we're in an approved credit position, having recently been upgraded to triple B flat by both Moody's and S&P. I think the summary here is that we're in a very strong balance sheet position, and we have the financial flexibility to continue to make the investments that are necessary to drive the long-term growth of our business. And as we look to allocate capital, we are in fact making those investments. You heard from Jay today, that we will invest over $700 million in R&D in fiscal 2020. And you heard from Mark about the investments that we continue to make to double the sales capacity uh, that, exists, uh, that exists with our frontline sellers. Beyond those investments, value creation through M&A is a strategic priority for our management team. We have an active M&A funnel development process. We're looking for targets in near adjacent markets that are aligned with our targeted growth strategy. But it's important to note we have and will remain patient and disciplined when it comes to the strategic and fina financial hurdles we expect from an M&A target. Beyond M&A, beyond we are actively returning capital. We have a $500 million share repurchase authorization with over $300 million remaining. 
We've been executing that buyback over the last several quarters with the intent of, of offsetting the dilutive impact of our equity-based compensation programs. But there certainly are scenarios where you could expect us to be more aggressive and opportunistic with that buyback program. And ultimately, that, that decision will be tied to our liquidity position, the valuation of our stock, and the strength and actionability of our M&A funnel. We actually use the same ROIC-based models to evaluate our, our buyback program that we use to evaluate those M&A opportunities. As we look to build that M&A funnel, strategically, we're looking for targets that will accelerate our ability to achieve our near and long-term strategic objectives. Increasingly, that's driving us toward look for targets that have high software content and high recurring revenue. ROIC is the main financial hurdle we, have, we use to evaluate potential M&A opportunities, but it's important to note that we take a long-term view of value creation through M&A. We have learned and continue to learn that it can take a significant amount of time to align the technology roadmaps and R&D teams when bringing two high-tech companies together. So we're focused on finding targets that will enable us to generate year five return on invested capital that is materially above our cost of capital. Ideal M&A target is one that's accretive to our organic growth rate as well as to our gross margins. And once again, that's increasingly driving us to those targets that have high software content. Before I wrap up today, I want to take a, take a moment to summarize the financial commitments that we're making. We believe our markets have long-term secular dri growth drivers that align well with their own differentiation. As a result, we're raising the long-term growth expectation for Keysight to 4 to 6%. We remain committed to our operating model and to delivering 40% operating leverage anytime our growth is 4%, 40%, excuse me, 40% operating leverage anytime our growth is 4% or higher, and that will enable us to drive our operating margins to the 26 or 27% level, reaching that threshold by fiscal 23. And we might, while we migrate from here to there, we will continue to deliver EPS growth that is at least 10% annually. In summary, I continue to believe that Keysight represents a compelling value proposition for our investors. We're a market leader and a large, diverse, growing end market. We have a highly diversified business. We're diversified ge geographically. We're diversified across a broad range of industries and we sell to over 30,000 customers, with no customer making up more than 5% of our revenues. We're making significant investments in both our R&D teams and in our sales teams to ensure that we're positioned to continue to outgrow our markets. And increasingly, that growth is being driven by our, our, the fact that we're selling our com customers complete solutions that are first to market, they're highly differentiated, and they have higher software and services content. That's increasing the resiliency of our top line. It's allowing us to drive higher gross margins, and it positions us today to once again raise the bar in our financial performance as we now expect to drive our operating margins to the 26 or 27% level by fiscal 23. So with that, I'm going to hand it back to Jason, who will get us prepped for the final Q&A. Hello, my name is Erica Clower. I uh, thank you so much for such a thorough presentation. I had a question regarding your market share. Ron, you had mentioned that your share gains have occurred on a steady basis over the last couple of years. And when I uh, listen to what you've presented today, it occurs to me that perhaps those share gains might accelerate somewhat. Um, and I wanted to ask if we could drill down a little bit further on the puts and takes there as it relates to how the acquisitions might assist with sh further share gains, the evolution of the market, and then in addition, the added um, tool in your war chest with regards to adding more software um, as, an, as a way to assist your customers further. Thank you. Sure. We don't like to talk very much about uh, about our competitors and, rel and relative to them. We've got a lot of good competitors, but we're very convinced that we can achieve the growth targets and the operating profit targets and the cash flow objectives um, that we have, have outlined. Our share gains uh, will, I believe, will continue. And if you look at certain areas such as 5G, our 5G share gains have been massive over 4G. We expect 5G share gains to continue, not only from what we're seeing in R&D, 
as well as the share that we used to have in manufacturing and the expansion there as we have more, uh, more opportunity with new solutions. But as you go further on back into the network and look at, look at the opportunities that exist from the network test business and especially the network visibility, that's another large opportunity for us. When you look at the, when you also, when you look at the electronic industrial area, there is no doubt that in AV, autonomous vehicles and electric vehicles, that's another big share game for us. And a, another way to put it is if you look at what, what I you know, said or the, and the team said five years ago, we said we were going to go after 5G and we've had tremendous uh, share gains there. We said we'd go after automotive and we've gotten share gains there. We said we would grow software and we've grown that well above the market late rates. We said we would grow support and we've done, done that. And all of that together, where we focused, we've been very successful. I don't anticipate that to change. When we get into 6G and that becomes material, now it's in the early research phase. There's an opportunity for us to take that up even further, as well as in quantum, uh, quantum computing. All right, thanks, Ron. Other questions? Um, another one from Tim. We'll come back over here to the right. Thank you, uh, Tim Long at Barclays again. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Mark, uh, I had a question for you on um, the Salesforce expansion. Um, could you talk a little bit um, and maybe tie e-commerce uh, into this? Um, talk a little bit about kind of diminishing returns. Obviously, you're not going to find a Nokia and Ericsson or a Qualcomm out there as new customers. So can you talk a little bit about um, the scale that you're going to need as you kind of go on the longer tail of, um, of, of the potential customer pipeline and what that means uh, for the metrics that you're going to look at, obviously, you know, revenue per customer or anything like that will probably be a little bit different uh, than the model now. Or are you also just adding more to some of the larger accounts? Thank you. Yeah. So as I mentioned before, our resource deployment is not being done in a peanut butter fashion. We're prioritizing it where we see the best growth opportunities. Some of those are geographic. Some of those are industry-based. Some of those are customer-based. So where we have been focusing so far is on uh, fortifying our, our presence with some of the largest customers, the industry leaders, as I talked about. That gives us better influence and insight to their needs. And then the second part is, again, across the geography uh, to leverage those successes using e-commerce as well. But the, the solution sale uh, is still a very complex uh, an involved collaborative sale with our customers, whether it's an industry-leading customer or a startup or somewhere in between, right? So that's the way we're deploying our resources. We're watching this very carefully so that we're getting the return that we expect. And right now it's above what we expected because our efficiencies and productivities have been improving. The other thing we're finding, which is very exciting, is that a high percentage of our first-time customers become repeat customers every year. So as we add thousands of new customers every year, they become recurring customers for us and we continue to expand our business with them. And then finally, the e-commerce element, it's still early days with that, but what we are hearing and what we expect to hear is customer preference. It's not only about creating a, a lower cost channel for Keysight, that's part of it, but customers who wanna buy their fifth or sixth product wanna do so in a very effective way. And that's what e-commerce is providing them, okay? Great. Thanks, Mark. Sure. Rick? Yeah, uh, Rick Eastman at Baird. Neil, just one thought. Um, when I look at the financial framework that you laid out, you've got um, gross margin up kind of one to 300 basis points over the next three years. Um, and we've heard a lot about software, um, but maybe, maybe just give a few puts and takes on the gross margin improvement that you'll show going forward. I mean, will we have the same tailwind on mix? Um, you know, service growth probably is a little bit of a challenge on the gross margin line, but just maybe puts and takes what you've tried to factor into that one to 300 basis point improvement. Yeah, there are a number of different things that uh, they're playing there. Obviously, we are seeing above average growth from software and services on a gross margin line. Those things tend to offset. Obviously, the software business is materially above our average gross margin. Our services business is below. 
Um, I also talked about the mix shift uh, towards R&D, but as, the, as technologies like 5G move into manufacturing, you know, there's potential for, uh, for, the, for, for, for us to add significant manufacturing revenues, at least in that market over this period of time. So you're, you're juggling a number of different puts and takes uh, across the business. But I think in the end, the trend lines for our business are clear. Increasing migration towards complete solutions with higher software content should enable us to continue to, uh, to, continue to raise uh, gross margins as we look forward. Okay, thanks, Neil. Nick? Nick, again, on behalf of Medi. Uh, so first, for EISG, uh, is there a potential opportunity to bundle kind of the mixed signals, semi-sales, with the board sales, and mixing those two revenue opportunities? Can you repeat the uh, question? Sorry. Yeah. yeah, is there an opportunity to bundle mixed signal sales on the component level with, with board revenue sales on the semiconductor business? Well, so, so maybe let me elaborate a little bit about the uh, semiconductor uh, business that we have. The, the focus that we have is really primarily around wafer fabrication. So I would say that the, uh, the biggest component of the sales is really around the... Uh, Three, three elements. One is uh, process development. The other one is device characterization. And then the third element is in-process control. And this is the, uh, the uh, value that we delivered more around with a fabrication. Now, most of the growth that we've seen and we are focusing on is really trying to be at the forefront of the innovation stream. And that's really where we are working with all the uh, process node uh, upgrade. So for instance, we are working with the, uh, at this point, we're working on a fan, fine nanometer process. Okay. So I think that really is predominantly is really where most of our business is. Now, I did mention in my presentation that uh, the last two years or so, we've started to invest into more uh, so-called mixed signal devices, analog and digital devices. And we have launched uh, recently a couple of solutions around silicon photonics and millimeter wave ICs. Right. So again, the, the focus there is really around wafer fabrication. I just want to elaborate that. We don't provide the full solution all the way down to uh, packaging. We don't do that. So it's really all around device, wafer structure, fabrication. Okay. So I'm just, Thank you. And can I do a quick follow-up if that's, that's possible? Right. Okay. Just about uh, Pathwave. Just speak up a little bit. <coughs> Sorry, for Pathwave, is the revenue opportunity primarily about being able to upsell down the stream. So once you get to manufacturing, you're keeping the customer within the keys ecosystem, or is it also about generating revenue internally? You get to like weigh those two. The, I'll let Jay uh, get a chance to talk about this, but we want to do a couple of things. What we really like to do is have an ecosystem that's like iOS or Android, where that is the framework that you use and our tools will be plentiful that you can use up and down throughout the process. So from early design all the way through to operations. So by doing that, you create the sticky environment and it's just a lot easier to work with the Keysight framework, to have the same user interface, to have the exact same data flows. And then what you have there is a simpler solution. So therefore it helps achieve our company objective of helping customers get, you know, bring their pro uh, their products to market sooner. So it's all about being first to market. So that's that's the primary, um, you know, the primary reason. Anything else, Jay? To add? No, I think you covered it. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions, Brian? Follow the same order. Um, Brian Yun again from Deutsche Bank. Two questions on the profitability outlook. First, can you unpack uh, how you get to 26 to 27 percent operating margin levels? I understand uh, the revenue growth and, and gross margin expansion, but are there levers on the OPEX side that you're baking into that guide? Uh, and then on EPS growth, the past few years have been significantly uh, above 10 percent. So curious as to why you, you kind of kept uh, the, the new target similar to the prior target. Thanks. 
Yeah, so let me touch on the first part of that with regard to the, the profit expansion towards 26 or 27 percent. So the high level model, I think, is clear, right? 40 percent, uh, four to six percent growth with the 40 percent operating leverage gets gets you to the to those per, to those levels over the course of, of the next several years. I think as we look beyond that, obviously, we've talked about improvement to continue ability to continue to raise our, our gross margins. Uh, we'll continue to invest uh, significantly in the R&D line. We are not at this point looking for leverage within R&D. I would expect uh, that we would continue to invest even as our revenues grow at the 16% level. In fact, at the margin, I'd say there's more upward pressure on, on R&D rather than, rather than downward pressure. We continue to see a tremendous amount of pull from our customer base for us to do development work on their behalf. And so uh, right now we don't see that as a source of leverage. Uh, on the GNA line beyond sales, uh, you know, leverage is always the goal, right? We look to look, we look to grow our broad general administrative expenses at a rate that's significantly slower than the overall rate of revenue growth, even like, while we recognize that we need to we need to continue to provide salary increases and such to the employee base in that population. Second part of the question really had to do with EPS growth. Obviously, we've 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 uh, put up a very strong EPS growth over the past couple of years period of time when we've seen a pretty dramatic expansion in our gross margins, including almost 300 basis points of, of gross margin expansion over the most recent most recent fiscal year. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, we, we see additional opportunity to, to further that, but not at the same pace. I think, uh, you know, some uh, we we we, uh, we came further faster than we expected uh, relative to the model that was outlined two years ago. And we do see continued upside, but we do expect that that rate of growth to slow. I would, I would just add that when you look at a balance and manufacturing picks up a little bit, that's going to be a little bit of downward pressure on the margins, but we will outflank that with the other gross margin improvements that we have within the company. We've had a program in place in the company for about two years that has um, been towards driving our gross margins higher. That program will continue and it provides uh, great opportunities for us. Also, I'd say, but you can see by the numbers that we put up there and every and all the previous expectations, we're um, a conservative company. We still think those are the right targets to have and the right thing, but we have guided, uh, guided the street 21 quarters in a row since we've been public and we have met or exceeded 21 times. We've never, you know, uh, never done anything else. So we, uh, we will take things up when we think it's appropriate, but we think the, the level that we're talking now um, is the right level, especially since we have a much higher hurdle. It's a lot easier to improve your operating margins when you're at 18% than when you're at 25. You could take it further, but then you're gonna put more competitive pressure on your business. And we wanna make sure that we get the right balance of growth and margin expansion. All right, great. I think we have time for one last question, and then we'll wrap up for the day. So, do you, anyone want to ask the last question? Okay, David, can you bring up the microphone. Jason, Jason. Uh, David Ridley Lane, B of A again. Um, so, on the thirty billion dollar installed base, uh, can you help us sort of think about the? Uh, Attach rate that you're getting now on services, is there a way of going back into the base or is it all about getting the upfront attached when you sell new and how those dynamics are playing out? Obviously, you've done a, a good job over the last uh, two years. Sure. So both are opportunities for us, for sure. Um, we've always been good at going after our installed base, actually, and we're getting significantly better. So there's still opportunity there. Um, a lot of our growth is coming from attaching things up front, attaching services up front. That's a relatively new thing for us to be doing, to really focus on. It's growing dramatically. But even as we, they're complementary. So as we're going out and talking to each one of our customers now about the new Keysight Care programs and so forth, we're having a discussion about their entire installed base. So my team, together with Mark's team, is going out and doing what we're calling an an account-based selling activity, we're actually going and visiting every one of our big customers and having the discussion about key site care and attaching up front, and how do we cover your installed base. So that's early days, but I would say both are, uh, both are opportunities for us.